You know, uh, in that first carefully, but right at the beginning, I cut off the um, the 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 first part of my first sentence because I somehow managed to mispronounce your name. <laughs> How did you pronounce it? I, I can't remember, but I was like, oh no, I want to keep this sentence, but I need to remove that part because I don't want to confuse people. Did you say Jiren or something? Or? Uh, no, no. The, the weird thing was the result was like an actual name. Oh, that's weird. So if you'll recall, last time we talked about Darius. Darius the Great, as he is often called. Darius the first of his name. Yes. And you'll remember that during the end of Darius' reign, you know, in the beginning he had to deal with some revolts. Towards the middle, you know, he did a really good job of getting construction projects up, constructing Persepolis, reconstructing lots of temples for lots of religious figures. And then towards the end of his reign, he had some more revolts to deal with. So he wanted to... He started the first attack on Greece, the first of mm-hmm. two Persian invasions on Greece, because the Greeks are the ones that spurred the Ionians to revolt, and Darius wanted to punish them. And he also had an Egyptian belt rebellion to quell. So what Darius did first is he went after the Greeks, Darius retreats, Darius is preparing for a second invasion, and also dealing with the Egyptians who are currently rebelling. And then Darius' health fails, and then he dies. That's where we left off, right? That's where we left off. Okay, so we all know, and we left off by saying that we all know who the succeeder of Darius is, because we know about a Persian leader that attacked the Greeks, and we all know that person was infamously... Right? Yes, Hashayar Shah. Yes, <laughs> but that is too hard to pronounce, so what do we call him? We call him Xerxes. Yes, we call him Xerxes. Now, do you want to talk about the origins of Xerxes' Persian name? Of his Persian name? Okay, yeah, there's, there's a little bit of an interesting story to his name. I'm a linguist, so I love talking about this kind of stuff. Um, so Xerxes, the the name in Persian, the original name that is recorded in whatever various Persian texts you may find at this time is Hashayar Shah. So that makes his full title Hashayar Shah Shah and Shah. Now, now so, does that name have the letter K in it? Only if you spell it with Latin letters. Okay, got it. So, the, the, the first character, you may be thinking of when I spelled it out to you, the first character is H, which I transcribed as K-H. Got it. Okay. So, Hashayar Shah, yeah. Um, and so, that was, there, there's, a, there's a little bit too many Shahs for one word, especially sh- since uh, Shah is a Persian word that means king, right? So Shah and Shah is king of kings. That was the title of the Persian royalty. Um, so eventually the Shah part got cut off or assimilated into the rest of the title, so it just became Hashayar, and that's uh, still a very common name in uh, Persia and Iran today. I, I have a I know a guy named Hashayar. And, really? Uh, that's cool. Yeah, and he writes his name in latin xerxes really i was about to ask yeah that's right yeah so how hashayar shah became xerxes is a little bit odd it's it's easier to imagine when you realize that the the character that looks like an x is actually the greek character he so it's not actually a z sound as it was pronounced in ancient greeks the the name the greeks called him herches Oh. Yeah. Hmm. I kind of like I I kind of like Xerxes, you know. Consonants are so strong. <laughs> they are. It's it's much easier to to pronounce for English speakers, especially since we don't have the h consonant. And I've been pronouncing it badly this whole time. Yeah, herches. Herches. Okay, if yeah. only we were German. Yeah, German has this consonant. Modern Greek still has it. Um, so, so that, that is that the story of Xerxes' name? That's the story of Xerxes' name. That, now, at least how, that, that's all the interesting bits I can remember at the moment, I think. How would the Greeks say the next king's name, Artaxerxes? 
And then, how would the Persians say his name? You know? That's probably even more annoying. I would just call him Shah at that point. Or Mr. Shah. <laughs> Wait, really? Okay, so, uh, forgive me because my uh, Persian is incomplete. Um, I don't, I can't read the language particularly well, and I definitely can't speak it very well. But, um, so in modern Persian, Artaxerxes is pronounced, um, Ardashir? Ardashir? Ardashir, yes. I'm not totally sure on the, the vowels in there because, you know, it's written in the Arabic script, which is an abjad, so the vowels aren't written. Um, and in the old Persian, it was pronounced Artakshaksa. Artakshaksa. This is hard. What? Art. I don't know. Wait, okay, here. Here's the Greek. Artaxerxes. That's how the Greeks pronounced it. So actually really close. So they, they dropped the... Yes, they did. For Artaxerxes? Yeah. Yeah, I got the yeah. They did drop it. I just double checked the Xerxes, um, how his actual name was written or uh, pronounced in Old Persian, and yeah, for sure. So the Greeks did use the Z sound in that case. Okay. Kind of interesting. Yeah. Uh, actually, th there is some inconsistency here. Okay. Herodotus calls um, Artaxerxes uh, Artasiris. Ooh. Mm-hmm. Um, and in some Greek sources, uh, he is called um, Marachir. Where does that come from? Yeah, uh, well, that's actually a fun one. Uh, I'm sorry, Macrochir. And would it help if I gave you the Latin translation, Longimanus? Longimanus? Longimanus. Longimanus. Um... Longimanus. I don't know. It's, he was given that name by the Greeks because, allegedly, his right hand was longer than his left hand. What? His right hand was longer than his left hand. So thus, Macrochir and Longimanus. I don't know why. Hey. I, I feel like Longimanus makes sense as, as as large hand. Does that mean that? Oh, does that just mean bigger hand? Yeah, it just means big hand. <laughs> and then what's the other one? Uh, macro here. Oh, okay, macro is big. Or macro here. I'm I'm not. Oh wait. Okay, I have the Greek here. Uh, yeah, yeah, macro here. That's funny. Here, something like that. Wow. Okay. I, I, I also don't speak Greek. That's cool to know. That's fun. Huh. Interesting. Beautiful. Wish I was known as Macro Teal. Macro. Yeah. Here. I'm Here. Loose. I can't do it. I'm, uh, I need water or if, something. If, if, you were, if you were to try to pronounce it English-wise, it would be Macro Chair. <laughs> or something like that. Macro Chair. I need one of those. <laughs> They'd be very useful in Archon. In Archon mode? Yeah. All one of our StarCraft <laughs> listeners laughs. <laughs> ah. Anyway. Um, okay. Anything else cool about Xerxes and Artaxerxes' names? Or Arda Cyrus? Um, no. Okay. And for a piece of good news, GarageBand still works. So we're going to move on. <laughs> oh, that's good. Yeah, I thought oh, so. Actually, oh, there, was, there is one more thing about... Um, uh, Xerxes is, is uh, he was the he was called by the Hebrews. Um, uh, Cyrus, I have that in my notes. Yeah, <laughs> you have it in your notes. Yeah, yeah it's the first thing in my notes that he was also in the Book of Esther, which is pretty amazing. But they say he was that when they refer to Aha Ahasuerus, is that how do you pronounce it? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, Ahasuerus. In, 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 Ahasuerus, so something like that. In Hebrew, it's pronounced um, Ahasverosh. Now, now, is that first H weird? Because mine's underlined, actually. Yes. Is it emphasized differently? I don't, I don't know the transliteration of classical Hebrew. Okay. Um, or I, I don't know, uh, I don't know how to read 
the romanization of Hebrew. There we, okay, there we'll I'm looking that. at a... So I'm going to guess, based on what I know of Hebrew, that that's a pharyngeal sound, and I don't actually know how to make a pharyngeal sound. It's really hard. Okay. So it would be something like achashverosh. Okay. Except that was that was velar. Oh man, I don't know. Are you sure that the V is in a W? In, uh, in terms of how it's pronounced. Because I'm looking at um, something that looks like it's phonetic. And I, it has a W in it. I can't tell if this thing's actually phonetic because I don't look at phonetic stuff. But I think it is pronounced well, the hash for uh, and, and then it doesn't have an H on the end of it. Oh, actually, you know what? This is Tiberian. I'm totally wrong. Anyway, sorry. Yeah, the, the, uh, that's... Um... The difference between the modern and Tiberian systems is uh, the, the diacritics that are used. All right. And, um, yeah. Well, then, we shall we shall uh, come back to that later, then, I guess, at a later date, figuring out how to do that. All right, so, oh. the Xerxes, are the Xerxes, interesting names, interesting hands, right? Uh, yeah. Okay, so now we'll talk about Xerxes's, Xerxes, Xerxes, we're going to say Xerxes, Xerxes rise to power. Okay, yes. The, actually, if I recall, this is an interesting story, is it not? It's, it's a little interesting, because his rise to power was not quite as questionable as Darius's, but still questionable mm. nonetheless. So, okay. Darius, when he was a commoner, and by commoner, I mean nobleman, so, I mean, commoner is a stretch in my opinion. But, anyway, Darius, we talked about last time how Darius had about five wives and a total of something like 11 children. Not yes. that those numbers are exact, but uh, I'm pretty sure that's about what he did. His first son was born to him when he was a nobleman and when he had a wife that was a commoner. Okay? Okay. doke His name was Ar- Arto Bazinwaz. Arto Bazinwaz, or something like that. Oh, you know what? <laughs> there, no. Oh my gosh, his name's Arto. His name's Arto Bazin, but I had the word was right next to it, so his name's Art Arto Bazin, Artabazan. We're gonna say Artabazan. Okay. So I think that one sounds the best, don't you? Artabazan. I I think that's probably how it was pronounced. Okay. Yeah. So Artabazan was born to Darius when Darius was still a nobleman and he was married to a commoner, but Xerxes was the first child of Darius. After he became king, after he grew and maintained his iconic, beautiful beard, after he started dressing Mm -hmm. in purple and gold and demanding that people not look at him when he comes into the throne room, after he was the third king of the empire, that is when Xerxes was born. Okay? Right. So Xerxes, not the eldest son, but the son of the queen of the Persian Empire, Atatsa, who was a descendant of Cyrus and the son of the king after the king had become king. So you're saying he was the first son born to the purple? Yeah, he was born. Yeah, exactly. He was the first son born to the purple. So when the time came for Darius to choose a successor when Darius was falling ill, Xerxes was the one chosen and he was a natural choice due to his, you know, the way that his birthright worked. We're going to call it birthright. Okay, yeah. He had also been somewhat groomed for this position because he had been ruling over Babylon, Babylonia for 12 years. So by the time that his rule came around, Xerxes, by the time Darius died, Xerxes was 35 and he had been governing Babylonia well for 12 years. Okay. So that is how Xerxes rises to power. Artaxerxes' rise to power is a bit more interesting, but we will, we will just touch on that later. Oh, we're, we're going to talk. Okay, cool. Uh, just just very, very briefly. After Xerxes rises to power, he has to finish his father's, uh, we're going to call it quest. He has to finish his father's quest to end the rebellion in Egypt. And so Xerxes crushes the rebellion. He appoints one of his brothers to become the satrap of Egypt. And at around the same time, there is also a rebellion in Babylonia. But when Xerxes crushes the Babylonian Empire, he does something different from what his father would have done. So, while the fighting is going on, in addition to drawing, destroying some other things in Babylon, he also destroys the statue of Marduk, 
which has religious significance. And if you remember Darius' policy on how to rule foreign countries, or not foreign countries, any foreign people, he would rebuild all of their temples. And Xerxes, on the other hand, destroys one of their really important statues and then stops referring to himself as king of the Medes, Persia, Egypt, and Babylonia. He actually drops the last two from his title and he just refers to himself as king of the Medes and king of Persia. Hmm. You know, sort of writing them off as distinct places or, or in reality as places of note in the empire to begin with. Okay. So after, after that, you know, you can see that Xerxes was not too fond of Egypt and of Babylonia, and he, he was pretty harsh on them for rebelling against him. So that's all about Xerxes' rise to power, and now if there aren't any questions... All right, very cool. Okay. So, so, in, in the, so this is important for history because uh, this is the moment where um, Persia and Media stop being distinct political entities. Yes. Cool. Yeah, yeah. So Persia, Persia uh, assimilates them pretty much, and and yeah, exactly. Okay, continue. Yeah, it's a good thing to highlight. So, oh, um, so inevitably we're going to talk about some of the things between some of the differences between the movie Three Hundred and what history historians are telling us happened in the Battle of Thermopylae, <laughs> which is okay. something that's very important in um, Xerxes' life. And I wanted to look into this more, and maybe I will soon, but, I mean, in the time that we have, I just didn't think it was going to be possible. So, uh, I'm going to glance over right now, but we all remember the iconic scene where there's a, there's a Persian missionary that comes to Sparta, you know, yep. and Leonidas is there with his court, and the Persian missionary, you know, is making fun of Leonidas. He's demanding that he bend the knee, and they start and arguing. To, and to give a gift of. And to give what? To give a gift of. Earth and water, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so he's so in, in reality, they're all going around. All the Persian missionaries are, not missionaries, messengers are going around demanding taxes from not only the Greek states, but also all of their other subjects that the Persian Empire rules over. But yeah. Well, wait a minute, wait a minute, Earth wait a minute. Not, not, not taxes. The, the Greeks are still independent at this point. Yes. Um, so they're, they're, he's looking for tribute. Yes. Or, well, not tribute. He's looking for. Yeah, you're a, exactly right. Um, yep, you're right. You're right. Oh, okay. I have that in my notes. He goes. He goes to um, Athens, uh, Sparta, and then some of the nearby Greek city states, asking for tribute. You're right about that. I messed that up. All right, great. And then yes, continue with the scene. And then we all know what the messenger says. You know, King Leonidas is being a lunatic. So what does the messenger say? I don't actually know. I never saw the movie. Oh, you never saw the movie. Well, the messenger says... I never saw the movie. But you, you know what scene I'm talking about, right? I do know, yes. Okay, yeah. So the messenger says, this is madness. Right? Right. You know what? Maybe we should just put the clip... We should just put the sound clip in the podcast. That would be kind of fun. Ooh, but that'd anyway... Be playing with, that'd be playing with some copyright stuff. Well, uh, maybe. We'll, we'll send an email to... T- a tiny, tiny Gerard sample will probably get by. <laughs> Um, she says, this is madness. So then, how does King Leonidas reply? He replies, this is Sparta! Yep, and then what does he do? I bet that's going to clip in the recording. And then, then <laughs> he, <laughs> then, then he, he jump kicks him into the, into a well. Yes, he does. And that is actually what happens. In Athens, they throw the messenger into a pit, and in Sparta, they throw them into a well. And I couldn't believe that was true. <laughs> those, those Greeks, they've so, got some similar ideas of what to do with Persians. Yeah, I thought that was hilarious. <laughs> now, now I think that Athens probably did a better job, because that was probably perfectly good water, you know? 
Yeah, that's probably true. But and then if that's I, if I recall correctly, probably a way suckier way to die. Oh yeah, and if I recall correctly, the uh, the points of throwing them in the well that there was a particular reason that they chose a well and a great big pit to do this, right? Oh, they, is that they, earth and water? Earth and water. Yeah. They said that's you, hilarious. In, uh, Herodotus tells us that um, the, the I th- believe it was he specifically attributes this to an Athenian leader who who says you will find plenty of earth and water down there. Oh my gosh, that's awesome. Oh, I think you're so right. We're gonna we're gonna go to another really awesome quote later in this, but um, yeah, that's that's a great quote. I th- they might say that in the movie actually. I don't know. Um, anyway, so that's how the first Persian invasion starts, but they actually don't portray it in that way in 300, do they? Uh, well, I wouldn't know, but, uh, based on what I've heard from the film, is it not that the invasion army is already on the way? Yeah, but I feel like the movie doesn't highlight the fact that there's a 10-year gap between the Battle of Thermopylae and that happening. Oh, really? Yeah, I might have to rewatch the movie, which I'm fine with. Wait, he waits a whole... 10 years no no so that what i just talked about that happens then darius invades then oh. the battle of marathon then darius dies then oh. 10 years happen then xerxes marches that makes a whole lot more sense for the historical narrative yeah and then i think that they just they just snip out that part of the timeline you know but um i'll have to double check that that's interesting okay anyway so, no, no, I believe you because it does make a lot more sense for, for um, yeah, I, I don't know the reason for Darius's invasion. I know the reason for Xerxes' invasion. Xerxes wanted to continue the work of his father, but yeah. um, this makes a whole lot of sense for a motivation for Darius to invade in the first place, which is something we didn't talk about last time. Yeah. Yeah. So, well, Darius wanted to invade because of the Ionian Revolt, and then. He wanted Greece to pay, so he he demanded tribute, mm. and then whether or not he really wanted to go to war, you know, that kind of set him off, you know? I mean, for all we know, right, his right. tributes were so ridiculous that they had no choice, that Athens and Sparta had no choice but to refuse their tributes. Or, so, so if the tributes were too big, then Darius knew he was going to go to war, or if Darius mm. knew that the Athenians and Spartans were too, you know, too proud or too confident to take such a deal, you know. Okay, cool. And then, and then making that tribute, making that demand for tribute, might have just been an excuse to go to war, you know, so that they don't just declare war out of nowhere, maybe to give them a better reason, so that all their people would be on board or something, you know. Uh, so Darius, so the Greeks. I was suspected that Xerxes and the Persians were going to come back after the Battle of Marathon. So they built a giant fleet of, and I have no idea to pronounce how to pronounce this word, but I bet you do. Tyreremes? Tyreremes? What, how, how the heck do you say it? Tyreremes? Tyreremes. Tyreremes. Yeah. Okay, Tyreremes. Come on, man. That, that, that's, no, that's, I, a, I, that's a Civ 5 unit. There's like, yeah, I know, and I can't say it in Civ Five either. And I, I mean, it has eight M's and five R's. Like, what do you want me to do? I, no, it doesn't. <laughs> I feel like it does every time I, I look at it. I just typed "tryrememes" when, when I have it in my notes right here. So okay, so try try reams. Yes, yeah, so a try ream is a ship with three banks of oars. Yeah. So so in preparation for the fight. Greece built a fleet of triremes so that they could fight Xerxes' navy when Xerxes brought his navy, right? right So sounds great. So they built a fleet of triremes, fleet of triremes. What do they need now? Um, rowers. Uh, no. So they, they, have, they have their navy taken care of. What do they need now? Uh, now they need a land force. Yes. They, and... They know that the Persian force is too big for them to fight them on both land and sea effectively. So what the Greeks did 
was they got all of the city-states together, and they actually banded together, stopped warring among themselves, which is all they did before, as we all know. Oh, yeah. You know, got Greeks and Trojans fighting all the time, you know. And so they all banded together, and then because they compiled their forces, they had a fleet of triremes, mostly from the Greeks, and then they had a land army assembled because they assembled all the city-states together so that they could all fight together as one coherent union. And that is partially highlighted in 300. Now, whether or not... That might be a main topic of the second 300 movie, since the second 300 movie, I believe, is when... is after the Battle of Thermopylae, right? I think Correct, so, anyway. I, as I understand, the, the second film um, is a rough recounting of the Battle of Salamis. Yeah, okay, yep, and we'll, we'll get to that soon. Okay, awesome. So, so that's how Greek prepared, and then we all know that Xerxes prepared because he knew after his father died that he wanted to invade Greece again. Yeah. So, Greece dispatched their land army in the year 480, after they knew that Xerxes was on the move, and they sent 10,000 hoplites to a likely location where they could use their smaller numbers to their advantage. And that was called in a place called the Vale of Tempa. I think is how it's pronounced. Temp? Tempa? Hmm. Vale of Temp? I'll take your word for it. Okay. So they sent 10,000 hoplites. These, And we know hoplites are disciplined Greek soldiers that fight with spears and shields. Mm -hmm. they, are, they are a unit in both Age of Mythology and Civilization V. In case... <laughs> Yes, Anyone was curious. And they fight in, using the uh, famous phalanx formation. That's right. They do fight using the famous phalanx formation. That becomes important uh, in a little bit. So they were pulled back after next or one of our next topics, important leaders, great rulers, mm -hmm. Alexander the Great. So they were pulled back after Alexander the Great who will be a ruler for a future podcast, advises sure the Greeks that the Persians would likely bypass that enclosed area. And they would instead... Wait go a minute, through. wait a minute, what? what, what wait, how, how does Alexander the, figure into this? That's, that's what I read. Is this, is, this a, is this a historical anachronism? Wait a minute, wait a minute. Say, 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 say that one more time. Alexander the Great tells the Greeks not to put their troops in the Vale of Temp? No. Alexander the Great comes 200 years later. Yeah, I was a little suspicious of that. Okay. Okay. Let's, okay, so let's, let, let's up, do that part again. Let's look at Vale of Temp and figure out why they don't do this. Maybe it's a different Alexander. Mm -hmm. There were almost more Alexanders. Yeah, there are multiple King Alexanders to be aware of. So, for example, uh, maybe this um, is a different when king. I was doing oh, some Alexander of my research, the first. Alexander the first of Macedon. How about that? Does that's that so help? bad. It, yes, it does help. I was just about to explain, however, that uh, there's actually a later Alexander the first. So Alexander the Great, he built a city in um, Macedon, and he named it Alexandropolis. Okay. That city was later destroyed and lost. But there is a city very close to that spot in Greece today called Alexandropoulos. Oh, wow. And that was named after King Alexander I, who founded it, or he didn't found it, but who visited there in 1920. So this is a different Alexander I than the one that you're now telling me is Alexander I. That's so crazy. Alexander is a common Greek name. We have a mutual friend who's Greek and named Alexander. Oh, we do. Yeah, I probably take out his name from the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so Alexander the 1st of Macedon. Uh okay, yes. Wow, how many 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 10 11 12 13 14. I've got 14 Alexander the 1sts in history. That's ridiculous. And I bet there's not that many Dariuses or Xerxes. Probably but. not. Well, actually, no, there kind of are. There, there are at least five King Dariuses. Really? Yeah. 
Huh. Kings of Kings of Persia, of course. The, the, huh. there, there are several different kings of Alexander. So there's Alexander of Macedon, there's Alexander of Epirus, there's Pope Alexander, then there's Pope Alexander of Alexandria, and then Alexander of Scotland, Eric Alexander of... S I don't know how to pronounce that word. Moldavia? He's from Moldavia. Uh, Alexander of Georgia... Uh, I don't know how to pronounce that word. From Poland, Kakheti, Russia, Bulgaria, Serbia, Greece, Yugoslavia. Goodness gracious. My middle yeah. name is Alexander. Oh, yeah, that's right, it is. <laughs> but, you, but, you, but you're not a Greek. No, 0%. <laughs> I am Romanian, though. Ooh, there's a spider on the wall. Let me kill it. Die. What if I'm Romanian? I think I missed. I missed. If, what if you're Romanian? Yeah. I, I don't think it's a Romanian name either. Okay, I was hoping that would count. Well, it's... All right. Yeah. The Romanians trace their stuff uh, back to the, the Romans, mostly. The, the Romanian culture is derivative of um, Eastern Roman culture. The Romanian language is romance and such. Gotcha. Close. Yeah. Anyway. Anyway. So, Alexander I <laughs> of Macedon, who is not currently a future podcast topic. Who, who we're not going to do it. Yeah, we're not going to talk about Alexander I of Macedon. So, j just this is just to distinguish that he is not the Alexander that you're thinking about right now. Okay, yeah. Me. Um, yeah. He recommended they not station so many troops in the Vale because it was likely that the Persians could bypass the Vale through the Sarantaporo Pass. Okay. What the Greeks did was they retreated and they instead decided on a new strategy. What was the strategy? They stationed their troops in front of a very narrow pass instead. And I bet you okay. know the name of this pass. This pass is named Thermopylae. Yes, it is. So now they were faced with a problem of you could bypass Thermopylae by sea. So what do you think they did to prevent them from stop passing by sea? What they did was, well, I'm looking at a map here. Thermopylae is um, it's in kind of a bay straight thing. And yep. it's a very, very long straight um, there's no way that the Persians would ever be able to come from the south. So what they probably did is blockade uh, the the northern mouth of the strait. Am I right? Uh, yes, and they did that with all their... Tri they were planning to do that with all their tri triremes. Triremes. How did I do that? Triremes. Good? It's a two-syllable word. Triremes. Yeah. Triremes. Yeah, it shouldn't be that hard, but for some reason it's for me. <laughs> so, so that was the plan. Hold Thermopylae. Because you have a choke point there. Hold. I almost said trireme. And then <laughs> hold the nearby ocean position. and Because you can also make a blockade there. Protect Greece. Protect the Greek city-states. Repel the Persians using your inferior numbers, but better knowledge and usage of the battlegrounds. And then, you know, win the war. So that was the plan. Right on. So that, that's what they set out to do. So Themistocles, who we know was... Uh, was he a Greek general? I'm, I'm, I'm actually blanking on the title, but we know of him from, from the movies. He's the one that tells uh, Leonidas' story, correct? Uh, no, I, I believe in the films it's somebody else who tells the, Leonidas' story. Themistocles is an Athenian admiral. Okay, got it. So... Does, so, do we think that there was a good enough alliance? Well, okay, no, this makes sense. So, the Mystocles moves 7,000 Greeks to the pass at Thermopylae to delay the gigantic Persian army and navy. So, between the triremes and the foot soldiers, he put 7,000 Greeks there. Ancient sources claim that there were a million Persians on their way through the pass and through and on their way to defeat the Greek Navy, but modern day estimates range from about a hundred thousand to three hundred fifty thousand. So yeah, Her Herodotus says two and a half million. Yeah, 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 yeah. So yeah, I actually did see that as well. That seems like a ton. And the reason why <laughs> modern day estimates are significantly lower are based on 
things like what resources Xerxes would have had available to him in yeah. terms of people, in terms of literally wood, steel, food, you know, things like that. Logistics, yeah. You, you, what, you can't what was support, realistic? You can't support a two and a half million man army. That's absurd. Unless you're America. Well, okay, yes, but that's... <laughs> America also has 300 million people. Yeah. And back so, then, there were about 300 million people in the entire world. Exactly. So, so modern-day estimates, well, what do you want to put it at? 250,000, just to make it round? You know, whatever. 100,000 yep, yep, yep. 100, and change. So that, that's how many people the Persians were marching in with. But the nice thing was that... So, oh, okay. So the really important thing you have to think about is that the Greeks had 7,000 people, and as we all know, there were the 300 Spartans guarding a particular part of the pass in Thermopylae where the Persians could go through. And you think about this. You say the Greeks had 7,000 people, then there were the 300 Spartans with all of their friends, you know, because they brought other people with them, and they mm -hmm. knew the area. And they were all camped out here for a long time. There's a total of you know, 8,000-ish Greeks yep, yep. camping out in an area that they know fairly well. Yes. Right? And they have access to the sea. They have access to land. They probably have scouts up ahead. So what the Greeks are doing is they're, you know, living off the land for a while, waiting for the Xerxes to come. And because they're such a small force, they can camp out there pretty much indefinitely. You also know that when you have an army of hundreds of thousands of people moving across the land, a major concern is getting those people fed, you know? And if, if they stay in any place too long, they will just decimate. They will absolutely decimate that area because they will eat so much of the food, you know? Oh, okay. So, so a nice thing that the Greeks had working for them is that Xerxes had no choice but to attack or to retreat by the time he got to Thermopylae. Because the land could not support his army. Okay, yes, 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 I understand. So, eventually, the Greeks, the Persians get to Thermopylae, and the fighting finally begins. The Battle of Thermopylae begins. Right, so this is, this is a three-day battle. What happens on the first day? So, on the, the first thing that Xerxes does on the first day of the battle, he sends forward his archers. And... This is, this is the first day of the battle, and he's, at this point, he's fighting with Leonidas and Leonidas' small guard of 300 Persians and then... 300 Spartans. Oh, I have the numbers somewhere. Uh, yeah, sorry, 300 Spartans, many, 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 many more Persians. Many, 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 many more Greeks, you mean? Uh, no, there weren't... Okay, he had, he had a couple hundred... I have written down mercenaries, that's totally not right. Oh, you know what? I actually don't have written down what happens on the first day, buddy. I'm sorry about that. Oh, that's okay. Uh, I have written down what happens on the second and third days, which is when Xerxes instead attacks the rear guard, which is done by Leonidas. So, yeah, what does happen on the first day? Um, on the first day, the entire Greek 7,000-man army is present um, guarding this pass, and the battle is basically fought to a standstill. The Greek phalanx is uh, very, very good at space control. Um, yeah, they the, the phalanx formation involves forming basically what amounts to a spear wall with lots of pointy things poking out of it. No, a shield wall with lots. Of oh, pointy I'm sorry. Things yes, a out shield of it. wall with lots of pointy things poking out of it. Yes, and this is done. This is shown pretty well, um, not only in the bat, in the movie 300, but also in the movie Troy, which has Brad Pitt playing Achilles. Correct. Oh. Yeah, uh, it's been a very long time since I've seen Troy, but um, I do think you're right. Uh, yeah, and well, that ex movie except, except for the part of the film where they break the phalanx, that doesn't happen. Oh yeah, yeah. Because in the movie they make a phalanx of probably about fifty people, and then they just run forward and then kill all the archers, and it's awesome. <laughs> and it's like people jumping on top of each other in the phalanx to make a vertical part. <laughs> yeah i imagine that's yeah not that that's how the greeks wish it was yeah that makes sense so yeah so yeah phalanx they formed their phalanx 
Um, and, and yes, so the, this phalanx of 7,000 Greeks um, was solid, and they held the line for a full day, and the battle came to an end. And then okay. Xerxes Okay, another thing something. that I should mention, so I actually did have a few notes on what happened on the first day. Not only did they have a phalanx, but while using the phalanx, they feigned retreat against the Persians. And then after feigning retreat for a certain amount of time, they stopped feigning retreat, turned around, and killed a bunch of Persians. Oh, that's very clever. Yeah. During the first day, they killed many Persians. And during the second day, um, Xerxes instead of Persians, thinking that immortals would get the job done. But the immortals fared well, the, no the better. The immortals were Persians. Oh, uh, yeah. Well, better than regular Persians, I should say. Okay, yeah. Um, okay. But the very first thing Xerxes did in this battle is he fired arrows. Mm. And in this pass that was very, very small, the Persians managed to shoot 5,000 arrows at the Greeks before sending in his first wave of troops. Okay? Wow. Okay, that is a lot of arrows. And so all of the Greeks were present, and according to Plutarch, one soldier said... I translated this in Latin class. Oh, yeah? So, <laughs> do, you want to, do you want to say your translation? No, I, I, it's been years since I've done it. Oh, okay. I don't have the Latin with me. According to Plutarch, this is what happens in history. One of the Greek soldiers says, People say that there are so many of these barbarians that the arrows of these barbarians make it impossible to see the sun. And Leonidas replies, Won't it be nice, then, if we shall have shade in which to fight them? Oh my god. What a guy. That's so sick. <laughs> yeah. So Herodotus uh, says that Dionikes, or Dionikes, I actually don't know anything else about him. Herodotus says he says that account. But I like the idea that Leonidas said it. That's funny. <laughs> Good old Gerard. So the next day, Xerxes finds out that there is a a rear pass. And I think this is what you're talking about, right? That's right. This is not... So So he finds a rear pass, and this rear pass is being defended by Leonidas. You're not talking about the betrayal yet, are you? Uh, yeah. So it's, it, this, is, this pass is not defended by uh, Leonidas and the Spartans, and that's exactly the problem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yes. So, so a, a betrayal occurs where... Uh, a man named Ephialtes, who thinks he's going to get a reward for betraying the Greeks, tells the tells Xerxes that there is a a a part of this pass that they can use to flank the Greeks and make advantage of their large numbers. Yes. Interestingly enough, you'll you'll enjoy hearing this because you're a linguist and you like the science of names. Um, Ephialtes mm -hmm. is now a name that is not commonly used by the Greeks, and I would consider this a an equivalent of the name Judas, you know, now that Judas is no longer used. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because his name is associated with betrayal. So, so that's a cool thing to know about the Phileties. That totally makes sense. Yeah. Yes. So then what happened was Leonidas stayed behind with 300 Spartans and several hundred mercenaries. And the reason, one of the reasons why Leonidas stayed behind is because at the time Xerxes started moving out, they visited the Oracle of Delphi, and the Oracle of Delphi alluded to the fact that Leonidas' death was certain since he and the rest of the Greeks had disobeyed military apartheid during a Spartan holiday. Okay. And not only did they disobey military apartheid during the Spartan holiday, most of Greece disobeyed the law that you couldn't make military movements during the Olympics. Oh. So they made two decisions that were kind of against their religious beliefs. So, so what Leonidas does is he brings with him 300 men, all of whom are, father, are without children, because he, he thinks that his mission is doomed to fail and he doesn't want to leave behind any broken families. And he brings them as an advanced guard, and then this advanced guard that he brought out to fight the Persians 
is the guard that stays behind with him, along with several hundred other people from the city-states, to block the Persians from attacking the Greeks as they make their retreat. So if they had stood in the past, they would have gotten annihilated. Um, if Leonidas had not stayed in the past, they would have been cut down as they were retreating. But instead, we are left with the story of the 300. Right. So the 300 Spartans, along with the other mercenaries, defend the pass for a full day and then are finally defeated by Xerxes and their superior numbers. And also contrary to what his father would have done, in Persia it was common practice to hold any military person, whether he was fighting for you or against you, in high esteem if they had made amazing contributions or had accomplished amazing feats in war. Which Leonidas had obviously done, you know, holding a pass against 100,000 people with 1,000 for a, over a day, you know, killing many, many, many mm. people, right? What Xerxes does is he has Leonidas beheaded and crucified. Ooh, that's unpleasant. Yes. Wait, wait, in that order? I think so, yeah. But um, I'm not positive. Hmm, okay. But, um, yeah, it's interesting to know what order it would be in. But anyway, um, yeah, for all we know, he was, like, crucified, and then they had his head you know, a few feet above where it was supposed to be. Who knows? Anyway. <laughs> um, okay. So, Themistocles hears of the defeat. Thermopylae, the land pass has been overwhelmed. There's no point in holding the sea choke because they're not going to come that way. He pulls back his forces and retreats them to Salamandas. And in 480 cool. BC, just a year later, uh, less than a year later, which makes sense because, you know, it's not that far away from where Thermopylae was or where the ocean passed next to it was. His navy dominates the Persian navy in the Battle of Salamandus. You mean Salamis? Yeah, Salamis. I don't know why, why I have Salamandus written down. His navy yeah, dominates uh, uh, the Persian navy. And, and, and it, it is not nearby, by the way. The Battle of Salamis, um, Salamis is the island that's, like, uh, right next to Athens. Oh, never mind that. Oopsie daisies. So, uh, well, this I, is this battle. Well, I mean, like battle. less than a year later. So, I mean, I guess, I guess in that respect, okay, I yeah. mean, like it wasn't wasn't across the world. That's that's kind of what I meant. So, right. so uh, the battle of uh, Salamis after Thermopylae, the Persian army uh, needs time um, to move through the Greek land and do their conquering, and meanwhile, the Persian fleet travels around the uh, Boeotian Peninsula towards the city of Athens. Um, and Themistocles prepares his s smaller navy. Again, the, the Greeks are outnumbered here. Not as badly as at Thermopylae, but they are outnumbered here. Um, in defense of Athens to save it from the Greek forces and in this navy so that they have time to escape. And this is actually extremely similar. So, um, And, of course, the battle is not only a successful defense, but a decisive victory. Um, the Persian fleet is more or less wiped out. Um, I can't recall the details of the battle here. Maybe you can. Um, but the end result is a decisive victory for the uh, Greek coalition forces and a successful evacuation of Athens. So when the Persians get there, there there's n nobody to kill. Correct, yeah. Yeah, so I don't, I don't have the numbers either. I know that it was decisive enough that this is the point when Xerxes abandons his quest because without boats, he feels stranded and he's in danger of, you know, being cut off and he's in danger of losing an entire army, you know? That's right. Well, and actually, he, he, <laughs> he is in danger of losing his entire army because what happens next? Well, I thought that he started retreating, and then while retreating, he lost his many troops to famine. He lost troops to disease. And on his way back to Persia, he appoints a new military leader, Mardonius, and he's handily defeated in three different battles. The Battle of Plateau, the Battle of Thebes, uh, and what were you saying? Plataea. Plataea. Yeah, I thought that I was missing a U, but I'm not. <laughs> so the battle. Of, so then next comes the Battle of Plataea, the Battle of Thebes, and the naval battle at Mycale, or Mycale, or Mycale. Is that what you're referring to? 
Yes, yes, that is what I'm referring to. Specifically, the Battle of Plataea. This is considered uh, the decisive action of um, the Second Persian War. Yeah. Um, so I don't have, I don't actually have yes. many details on uh, the Battle of Plataea, other than the fact that Persia's Mardonius is killed, and the Persian spirits are broken, and they have a decisive loss. Do you have anything else on there? What I have is that the the fight is very, very long. The Greeks continuously push into the Persian lines. The, according to one account, the Persians try to break the Greek spears by grabbing them. Um, but whenever they would try this, the Greeks would rapidly switch the swords and cut down um, the attempted grapplers. Um, so this is the importance of the hoplite gear, uh, the hoplite outfit of a spear and yep. a sword and a shield. Yep. Uh, Mardonius was uh, killed when he stood his ground while the rest of his army was being pushed back. He was surrounded and supposedly uh, struck in the, in the head with a rock. Um, what a way to go. Yeah. So we, when Mardonius died, the Persian retreat became a general rout. Um, they retreated back to their camp behind their walls. So the Persians were generally routed. And that was more or less that. The Persian forces retreated. However, the Persians had Greek allies. The Persians were fighting with a Theban auxiliary. And um, the auxiliary was stationed on the Persian right, fighting against the Athenians. But, according to Herodotus, these Thebans were deliberately fighting badly. Um, they retreated. They retreated behind the wall, but the wall was fairly quickly breached the the persians who remained were killed to a man by the greeks uh, of those persians who had uh, got, gotten into this their camp behind the wall uh, 3000 survived and uh, herodotus doesn't tell us how many there were oh my gosh um, yeah so according to herodotus again only uh, 43000 persians survived this battle over uh, out of at least 250000 who were who began Though, of course, Herodotus has proven to be bad at numbers. Yeah. Herodotus also says that, as a whole, the Greek forces lost 160 men. Yeah, that seems unlikely. Yeah, probably not. Um, the Roman historian Plutarch? Yes. Uh, he, he tells us there were uh, 12 or 1,360 Greek casualties, which is a much more likely number. Although there are some historians who give higher numbers, up to 10,000. But th it's very clear that this was a crushing, decisive defeat for the Persians. They had no choice but to go home. Yes, yes they did. So, um... Okay. So one thing... So now we're going to go into the conclusion. Uh, I just have two more Good. points. Go for it. Persian military ambition. So the desire of Persia to go out and conquer new locations. Right. That greatly declines after his defeat at Plataea. Not only that, but Greece becomes much more powerful. There is the formation of something called the Delian League, which I have not researched. And there's also trouble on the rest coast of Asia Minor, which I have not researched. So I'd be interested to see why each of those affect Persia. But basically, Persia, the Persian Empire hits a height at the times of Darius and Xerxes and then sort of declines from there. Something that I neglected to mention earlier is that early in Xerxes' reign, he continues the construction of the gigantic terrace of the Apadana, mm -hmm. the Tripolon, and a treasury. Okay. He also made his own palace southeast of Darius's. He created the harem, which is a line of small identical rooms. And that's supposed to have held all of Xerxes' treasure. Okay. He also started the construction of the Hall of a Hundred Columns, which is the throne room. Cool. But he only finished the paving and the base of the walls, so he never actually got to do everything that he wanted to. Okay, but but it, it was completed by our Xerxes? Uh, that I'm not sure okay. of, actually. That would be cool if it was. That would be a nice historical site. Yes, I agree. So I would love to research some of those historical sites since I am super into architecture and stuff like that, as I know you are as well. Mm -hmm. So, as long as there are no further questions, that concludes our podcast on Xerxes. Um, we should note that Xerxes dies by the 
by a palace chamberman named Artabanus. Wait, he died? So he was assassinated? He's murdered, yeah. Oh, wow. By by an unhappy member of his court, or unhappy members of his court helped help to put that in motion. Wow, okay. So, that's by Artabanus. Artabanus accuses Xerxes' eldest son and heir, Darius, of murdering his father. He gets Artaxerxes to support him in executing Darius. And then he plans to do the same thing to Artaxerxes. Oh. So this is what happens. Artabanus kills Xerxes. Artabanus Mm. accuses Darius II, I'm guessing that you can call him now, the son of Xerxes, of murdering his father. Artaxerxes says, yeah, you know, he probably did. So he agrees with Artabanus, and they both put into motion the events that caused Darius to get executed. And then Artabanus tries to do the exact same thing to Artaxerxes, tries to get him killed too. But Artaxerxes is informed by Megabizus or Megabizus of the plot. So Artaxerxes puts Artabanus to death, along with all three sons of Artabanus. Then Artaxerxes assumes the throne, and he becomes the next ruler of Persia. Hmm. So scandalous. That is, yeah. And then I don't know if anything as interesting happens in Artaxerxes' reign. I don't think I'm. I'm not sure that it warrants a full podcast. Maybe we'll do that later. I would much rather, I think, move on to a topic that you have been looking forward to for a while, right, Jeff? Yes, that's right. So I think we're going to move on to um, uh, talking about the post. Persian Wars, Greece, starting with the Peloponnesian War, um, and then uh, Alexander the Great, our next household name, great person. All right. Yeah. Sounds awesome. All right. I'll see you then. Yep. Sounds great, buddy. Thanks for listening, everyone. Thanks for listening, guys. Boom. Done. All right. Are, are you still recording, or do you want, do you want me to stop recording, too? Uh, I'm still recording, and I'm going to kill it very soon because uh the last pod the last uh, D guy just got here so oh. all right talk to you later bye oh boy an hour and 20 minutes this will be fun to edit down